delighted to welcome you to round two or round three and four of our Olympic seminar with Dr. Matt Andrews. Um, we've had an absolutely fantastic learning experience uh, with two excellent lectures. Um, we're looking forward to two more tonight. So uh, I want to remind you before we begin to please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll be happy to address as many questions as we can. We even have some left over from last night, I believe. So uh, happy to get at it. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Andrews. All right, thank you, Max, and hello, everyone. I had a great time uh, yesterday evening, and so I'm excited to be doing this again. In fact, I received some really nice emails from a couple of people who were watching yesterday, so thank you for, for, for that. I always like, like hearing from people and engaging. Um, so we, we got to know each other a little bit last night, uh, and so now I think it's time in our relationship to have a frank discussion about sex. Um, I want to explore the general story of female athletes at the Games, uh, the Olympic Games, but more specific than that right now, um, I want to explore the idea of, of gender difference at the Games. And I'm going to get even more specific. I, I want to explore the controversy and the contest over who gets to compete as female at the Olympic Games. And this is a story and a controversy that is right now rearing its head outside of the Olympics. You know, in this country, it seems every few weeks, a state like North Carolina passes a law about who may and may not be considered female when it comes to high school sports. Uh, this is the debate over transgender athletes. And I'll say something about transgender athletes at the Olympic Games at the end of the, the, the presentation. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the, in the Q&A. That's a story that I'm, I'm, I'm following with, with great interest. But right now is the story of sex verification at the Olympic Games. And as we're going to see, the Olympic Games are part of uh, the, the long, painful history of global society trying to find the line between male and female. So let's start with some general facts about female athletes at the Olympic Games. We talked a little bit about this last time in, in, in the question and answers, but I just want to ground us here in some, some years. When those guys met at the Sorbonne in 1894, when they created the International Olympic Committee and the modern Olympic Games, they were re, the Olympic Games, they were re, revived. Um, they made it very clear that these Olympic Games, these men made it very clear that these Olympic Games were for men. And that's what happened at those first games in 1896. It was male athletes only. And this gender exclusion, um, just it, it fit the, the, the larger ideas at the time. Uh, the idea that sports were something that only men did. Sports were an arena where men learned those, those uh, traits about being courageous and martial. The sporting arena was a space where men were transformed into men. Well, at the next Olympic Games in, in Paris, this is when women made their Olympic debut. The Paris Games of 1900. And women competed in two events. They competed in golf and tennis at these games, the, the genteel sports of the well-to-do. And then little by little, female participation at the games increased. Uh, there was archery in 1908, and I just want to show in this photograph because this amazing outfits that, that, that these athletes wore. Uh, women swimming came to the games in 1912. And then gymnastics and track and field. Uh, later, 1928, the Amsterdam Games of 1928. And the only reason that women began competing in track and field at the Olympic Games in 1928 um, is that female athletes, they had broken away from the Olympic movement. They'd created their, their own women's Olympic Games. And actually, it was this woman, Alice Mier, a, a French physical educator, who was so frustrated by the IOC's refusal to allow women to compete in track and field, what in, in Europe they just call athletics. And ath athletics, they're very much thought of as the, as the central events of, of the Olympic Games. She was so frustrated that women could not compete in athletics that she created a women's Olympics, uh, which because of the objections of the IOC, they said, uh -uh, you can't call it the Olympics. She ended up calling it the Women's World Games. The first of these games were in 1922. They were in Paris. Four years later, they were in Gutenberg, Sweden. Um, they lasted all the way until 1934. And they were a success 
they were commercially successful. It turned out people were interested in going to watch women compete in, in, in track and field. So the IOC said, okay, we'll let women compete in, 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 in track and field at the games. Once again, it was Amsterdam, 1928. Women competed in just a few events. The women's 800 meters, twice around the track. That was the, 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 the longest event, the longest running event that they let women participate in at these games. The Olympic Games have been part then of the long, slow fight for women's equality of opportunity when it comes to sports. For example, it was not until Sochi in 2014 that women were allowed by the IOC to compete in, in ski jumping. Uh, so this is, you know, this, this, this inequality is not something of the distant, distant past. Just only very recently that men and women compete more or less in the same events at the Olympic Games. The two most important individuals in the history of the Olympic Games, and I, I mentioned them both last time, they were very uneasy with the idea of female participation at these games. The Baron Coubertin in 1912, the founder of the modern games, he said, women's sport is the most unesthetic sight human eyes could contemplate. The Olympic Games must be reserved for men. Yeah, he's, we, as we say, we hate it when people sugarcoat their, their actual feelings. Look, Neanderthal from today's perspective, but not that out of step, pretty much right in step with the general male-dominated field of physical culture a century ago. Fast forward almost a full quarter century later. Here's Avery Brundage. He was the head of the United States Olympic Committee in 1936. He was at the Berlin Games in 1936. And he said, I am fed up to the ears with women as track and field competitors. Their charms sink to less than zero and they are unpleasing on the track. So, taking these quotes as our, our launching point, from the game's outset, there were these firmly held ideas that sports and womanhood, they were incompatible. You know, here are our assertions that, that, that real women do not compete in sports. And when they do, when women force their way in there, these men found women, found women competing strenuously to be an, an unpleasant sight. All right, I think the place to really start our discussion today is at the momentous Berlin Games in 1936. And these were games that were largely thought of as being about race, right? About Nazi ideas about race. When people talk about these games, that's usually what they talk about. Huh? And how these ideas about Aryan racial supremacy, they were refuted to a large degree by Jesse Owens of the United States. But these Berlin games were also very much about sex as well. Right. These were the Olympic Games that the United States, and I, I didn't talk about this last time, but you probably know this, the United States seriously considered boycotting these games because of what was going on in, in, in Nazi Germany. There was a fierce debate in the United States, but the Americans went. Um, and then the Germans and the Americans, they battled for athletic supremacy, each side desperately wanting to win the most medals. And it was in this contest, uh, the, 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 the tensions between the two, two nations and the, and the, and the hyper-competition between these two nations, the United States and Germany, that both sides made accusation that the other side was cheating. Accusations were made that the amazing female athletes that both sides had representing them at these games, that these female athletes actually weren't female athletes. They weren't actually women. And let me tell you about two of these athletes, an American and a German. One of the best athletes at the 1936 Berlin Games was the American sprinter Helen Stevens. And Stevens, she won the gold medal in the women's 100 meters, setting a world record. And after her gold medal victory, some German officials accused Helen Stevens of being a man dressed as a woman, a man masquerading as a woman to win the American's Olympic gold. You know, some pointed to her remarkable athleticism as proof that she was a man. I mean, she's just too fast to be a woman. That was the idea. Some pointed to her, her firm, quote-unquote, male-like muscles. Um, some talked about the particularities of her face. 
You know, here's very much where cultural ideas about beauty come into play. Does Helen Stevens look exactly like the women on the cover of Vogue magazine in the mid-1930s? Maybe not, but does that mean she isn't a woman? Of course not, but, but there were whispers and there was a public accusation made by the Germans. And the accusations were so loud, they were so forceful, that the United States Olympic Committee, they did something unprecedented. They told Helen Stevens that she had to be examined by an IOC doctor. This doctor was going to verify her sex. Stevens was ushered into a room. She was told to disrobe, and a doctor looked between her legs and examined her genitals. And on the basis of this examination, the doctor confirmed that she was female. It is an awfully invasive moment. I cannot imagine how it made Helen Stevens feel. But actually, this genital examination, this is what is going to happen to all female Olympians in just a couple decades. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working toward that. So that's Helen Stevens. Also competing at the Berlin Games was a German athlete, Dora Ratchen. And Dora Ratchen is an athlete who will have a direct effect on future Olympic policy. Uh, her, her story was later used as an example of why sex testing, why sex verification was necessary. Dora Ratchen competed at the Berlin Games in the high jump, and she came in fourth in the event. So no medal. So why did she become a storyline if she didn't win anything? Well, two years later, in 1938, Dora Ratchen is traveling on a train in Germany. And a passenger, and she's wearing a dress, and a passenger notices facial hair on Dora Ratchen and alerts the German police. And an accusation was made that Ratchen was a man masquerading in women's clothing, which was against the law in Nazi Germany in the late 1930s. The police questioned Ratchen on the train, and then a police doctor was brought in to examine Ratchen. And here's what we know, and I just want to say this, this all feels so invasive talking about it, it, it feels prurient. But again, Dora Ratchen's story, it has major ramifications for the Olympic movement, which is why I'm telling it. Dora Ratchen was examined, and Dora Ratchen is what today we would call intersex. Intersex is a term that is used when a person is born with a reproductive or a sexual anatomy that doesn't fit society's binary definition of male or female. You know, a person might be born uh, appearing to be female on the outside but have male genitalia on the inside or vice versa. A person might be born with genitals that are in between what society considers to be the usual male and female genitalia. So l let me say this and then I'll get back to Dora Ratchin. We like to think of sex as being binary. You know, in our society, there is male and there is female. Men have these physical attributes. Women have those physical attributes and reproductive organs. You're either one or the other, and that's that. But we also now know it's not that simple. Bio biology is not a binary. It's a spectrum. And on that spectrum, there are all types of body types. Human bodies often blur these binary distinctions. Intersex is a category that's hard to quantify, uh, as it depends on where you draw the line. Some studies suggest that one out of every 200 human beings should be characterized as intersex. Other studies say, no, it's more like one out of 5,000, maybe even higher. All right. Ratchen was born with ambiguous genitalia. The midwife who delivered Dora Ratchen had to announce a sex. Society tells her she has to pick. You have to say it's a boy or it's a girl. Uh, she said it's a girl. She determined that the child was female. The child was named Dora, raised as a girl. Dora was dressed in girls' clothes, sent to girls' schools. Dora competed in sports, in girls' sports in women's sports, but the older, older Dora got, the more, Dora later said, um, she began to feel as if she was male. And there were whispers about her in Berlin, 
Um, though the German Olympic Committee did not force her to be examined, like the United States Olympic Committee had forced Helen Stevens to be examined, um, probably because Dora Ratchin didn't win a medal. And so now in 1938, Dora Ratchin is stopped on that train, and with relief so apparent that the police officer wrote it down in his re report, Ratchin told the police officers that he, and I'm going to say he now, he had long suspected that he was male, he felt male, he identified as male, but he had always been told that he was female. And this arrest was a turning point in two ways. All right, it was a turning point for Heinrich Ratchen. That's Dora changed his name from Dora to Heinrich and began dressing and living and identifying as male. So it's that turning point. But this is also when the IOC started talking about the need for gender verification. And that's because Ratchen's story, it was made public. People were talking about it. And the story was made way less complicated than it actually was. The way the story was told, the story was told that Ratchen was a cheat. Ratchen was a fraud. The story of Dora Ratchen was the story of a man who dressed like a woman to try to win Olympic medals, to steal Olympic glory. And so to catch cheats like Heinrich Ratchen, sex verification was necessary. It is not right to call Heinrich Ratchen a cheat. Ratchen was someone who was wrestling with their gender identity, but that's the way the story was told. And so there was talk right after this of instituting some, types of, some type of sex verification procedure at the next Olympic Games. Those were going to be in Tokyo in 1940, but then World War II came and those games were canceled. And then the 1944 games, they were canceled. And so the Olympic movement, it began again in London in 1948. We talked about that yesterday. In 1948, the Olympics return. And this is when the IOC announces, we want verification that all female athletes are actually female. And so it's in 1948 that official sex verification begins at the Olympic Games. And since 1948, there have been four ways, four different ways that sex verification has taken place. The first way, beginning in London of 1948, Every female athlete was required to provide a letter from a doctor, from a physician, attesting to the fact that they were female. That's how it starts. It's a simple signed letter from a physician. These signed letters were called femininity certificates. They certified that the athlete was female. All right, problem solved. Well, no. Because in the next Olympics, which we talked about yesterday, the Helsinki Games of 1952, the Soviet Union joined the Olympic movement, and they stunned the world with the, the success of their female athletes. In 1952, Soviet women won 23 medals, and we'll compare this to United States women, they won eight medals. And in the West, in the United States, anxieties were raised. And part of this was clearly a reaction against Soviet women who did not fit Western notions of femininity. Western reporters, and we talked about this yesterday, they were always commenting on the bodies of, of, of Soviet women. Uh, mannish, not feminine, the Western press said. In fact, these two Soviet athletes, these were the athletes that American reporters picked on all the time. They were sisters, Tamara and Irina Press. Tamara Press on the left there, she dominated the shot put and the discus in the 1950s, the early 1960s. Arena Press, she competed in the hurdles. And American reporters, they accused these two sisters, sometimes subtly, sometimes explicitly, of being men in disguise. They said the Soviets cannot be trusted. The anxieties over the medal count were so high that American reporters said the Soviets are cheating. They're dressing men up as women so they can win the Cold War medal count. We can't trust those doctor's notes that are coming from Moscow. We need a different type of verification system. 
It's in the Cold War battle to win the medal count that the accusation was made that these Soviets, that the Soviets, that they were gender cheats. And so it's in that context and in the desire to catch these hypothetical Soviet and Eastern European gender cheats that a second method of sex verification was mandated. In the mid-1960s, the IOC implemented a mandatory genital check of every female competitor. And yes, you heard me right, a mandatory genital check. In some cases, this involved what came to be known as the nude parade, as each woman appeared under pants down, standing before a panel of doctors. In some cases, it involved an athlete lying on her back with her legs spread so doctors could examine her much more closely. Here's a political cartoon that speaks to the main objection of this verification method. And this satirical cartoon is very, very creepy. But that's the point, right? For female athletes being asked to parade naked or lie down and spread their legs and be examined by usually male doctors, this sex test felt like an assault. That's the word many used. It's an assault. No female athlete that at least has been made public ever flunked the nude parade, though it's believed that this test had the effect of um, discouraging any female athlete with ambiguous genitalia from even trying to compete in the Olympics. They did not want to be embarrassed like Dora Ratchin had. So there were complaints. Um, and it's in response to the complaints about these invasive genital checks that the IOC introduced a new method of sex verification in 1968. In 1968, the IOC started using a chromosome test. And actually, 1968 is when they started testing for performance-enhancing drugs also. You know, so, so science is starting to, to, to come into play here, chemical testing. So we've switched from an anatomical or an external definition of female with the genital check to a chromosomal or internal definition of what makes someone female. And the IOC, they thought, all right, we've, we've got this. This will settle things once and for all. The head of the IOC's medical commission, Arthur Porret, he's a, a, a French doctor, he said this is a very simple test to determine if an athlete is right or wrong. That's some pretty interesting and revealing language there, right or wrong. Maybe it's a translation issue. I hope it is. But he's the one who's wrong because it turns out it's not that simple. And here's how this went down. Beginning in 1968 at the Winter Olympics, which were in, in, in France, and then the Summer Games, which were in Mexico, Every female athlete had the inside of their mouth swabbed. This is what's known as the buckle smear test. And the chromosomes of these athletes, they were then checked. And if the relevant chromosomes were XX, then the athlete was considered female and allowed to compete as female. Uh, XY being the chromosomal designation for male. And Olympic officials, they considered this to be a much more dignified way of checking for sex. Uh, a much more objective way of rooting out the imposters, as they were called. Once a female athlete passed the buckle smear test, they were given an ID card attesting to their womanhood what some athletes called their femininity passport. Right? You carry this around so you can compete in the female competitions. Once again, there was opposition. Um, and look. I plead ignorant when it comes to most hard science, including the science of, of, of chromosomes, but I am told that this is a very problematic test. I am told that there are chromosomal varieties or conditions in which athletes who all their lives have identified as female might not pass this test by exhibiting those XX chromosomes. I am told that one out of every 1,666 people do not neatly match either the XX or XY chromosomal definition of male, female. One out of every 1,666 human beings are neither of those things. 
Critics say all this test, or said, all this test is going to do is shame athletes who all their lives have thought of themselves as female and merely have a chromosomal quirk. And here's an example of one such story. Here's an example of how this chromosome test played out. And I think it's a pretty good example uh, that's an argument against this test. Eva Klubikowska was a Polish sprinter who was among the first athletes to be ousted from competition because of the chromosome test. She was an athlete who had passed the genital check in 1964, and she was an Olympic gold medalist at the 1964 Tokyo Games. But four years later, in Mexico City, in 1968, she flunked the chromosome test. She reportedly had both XX and XXY chromosomes. What that actually means, I have no idea. Um, but to the IOC, it meant that you're not a real woman. She was barred from participating in the 1968 games. The next year, 1969, Klubikowska had a baby. This biological act seems to contradict the chromosomal findings that she was not female. And I am not saying that the ability to have a baby should be our test for participation in the games. Please don't think I'm saying that. But the fact that she gave birth to a child seems to contradict the IOC's ruling that she wasn't female. And here's an interesting side note. During the era of chromosomal testing, the only female Olympian who did not have to submit to a sex test was England's Princess Anne. She, commit, uh, she competed as a member of the British equestrian team in 1976. Since she was the daughter of Queen Elizabeth II, such a test was considered inappropriate. But I think this exception reveals the biases that are at work in this system. I mean, if it's inappropriate for a princess, it's inappropriate for all female athletes. And as someone actually pointed out back then in 1976, why do you even need to test equestrian riders as men and women compete against each other in the same competition? That actually makes no sense. And we're going to talk about the events in which men and women compete against each other in just a second. All right. So it was the case of Eva Klobikowska that led more and more doctors to say, all right, this chromosomal test, it's inaccurate. It's a problematic way to identify who's female. Some doctors also testified, even having this chromosomal abnormality, it doesn't give you any type of athletic advantage. These arguments against the buckle smear test led to its demise in the 1990s. And a new, a fourth way of testing emerged. And just as a review, first there was the letter from the doctor, then there was the genital check, then there was the chromosome test. And now, currently, the fourth method is suspicion-based androgen testing. Rather than testing everyone, there was a turn to suspicion-based testing. Any athlete suspected of gender abnormality can be tested. And specifically, what the IOC is looking for with this test is something called hyperandrogenism. Androgen is essentially testosterone, right? They're looking for testosterone levels. If a human being has hyperandrogenism, it means that their hormones produce a greater than average amount of testosterone. They, they, they naturally produce a greater uh, amount, or a greater than, than average amount of natural testosterone. And the idea here is that any woman with this condition produces more testosterone than the average woman, and thus she has an unfair advantage. I mean, really, she's just considered too manly. We'll get to that controversial idea in a moment. But here are the two most notable cases of athletes who have been flagged and had their careers interrupted based on accusations of hyper and, um, and, and, and androgenism. Excuse me. Castor Semenya of South Africa, the Republic of South Africa, and Duti Chand from India. Castor Semenya has world-class speed in the 800 meters, twice around the track. Duti Chand has very, very good, but not super exceptional speed in the 100 meters. 
And in the last several years, accusations were made about both of these athletes. And in both cases, the accusations that they had some sort of unfair biological advantage, and I, I think this is worth emphasizing, the accusations against both of these athletes came from other female athletes, came from women they were competing against, and they said it's not fair that we have to compete against them. Let me tell you about Duty Chand first, and then I'll get to Castor Semenya, who really has become the, the, the face of this, this issue. Duty Chand is Indian, and she was a rising star in the Indian sprinting world. And then in 2014, some other female sprinters from her country, they made an accusation. She was beating them in these races, and they made the public accusation that Duty Chand is not womanly enough. And that's actually the phrase that they use. She's not womanly enough. That sounds like a nebulous, imprecise accusation. Well, that's because it is exactly that. Duty Chand's accuser said that Chand was too muscular. In their original accusation, they pointed to the fact that Duty Chand did not have a boyfriend. This was evidence, they said, of gender abnormality. I mean, let me say this. If having a boyfriend is the eligibility test for all female athletes at the Olympic Games, we are in serious, serious trouble. The Indian Track and Field Association, they took these accusations seriously. Duti Chand was subjected to a variety of tests. Her blood and urine, they were analyzed. Her cheek was swabbed. She was put on a table. Her genitals were examined. They were measured. Let's go to the blood test. Her blood test revealed, doctors said, that she has hyperandrogenism. She has been told that she has too much testosterone. And she was given the same choice that any female athlete who was diagnosed with hyperandrogenism was, was given. She was told if you want to compete in inter international sports, you have to lower your testosterone level. You have to take drugs that will lower your testosterone level. And to better understand this controversy, I have spent more time reading medical journals than I ever thought I would in my life. And here's what I have learned. I think I can make this pretty, pretty straightforward. It was about a decade ago that the International Olympic Committee and the uh, International Track and Field Association, the IAAF, now they're just called World Athletics, but so it's the IOC and the Track and Field Federation. These are the two main organizations I'll be talking about here. About a decade ago, they came up with a number, a dividing point. And they said that the normal range for male testosterone level, male testosterone level, is more than 10 nanomoles per, per liter. So they said that's the threshold. If any athlete is past this threshold, 10 nanomoles per liter of testosterone in, in your blood, you cannot compete as female, regardless of other aspects of your biological presentation, how you look, whether you've had a baby, it doesn't matter if you're above 10 animals per liter, you are in the male range and you cannot compete as a female in our events. Duti Chand was over that 10 nanomoles per liter limit and she was told that she needed to take drugs to lower her testosterone level if she wanted to compete at the Olympic Games. And Duti Chand said no, she refused to do this. And she fought back. And here's her specific rebuttal. Here's what she said. The high androgen level produced by my body is natural. I have not doped or cheated. If I follow the guidelines that she was sent, I will have to undergo medical intervention in order to re, uh, reduce my naturally produced androgen levels. I feel perfectly healthy and I have no health complaints, so I do not want to undergo these procedures. I also understand that these interventions will most likely decrease my performance level because they will interfere with the way my body has worked my whole life. I'm a woman. I don't want to change. I don't want to dope, take drugs, and get under this, this level. She did not want to alter her body's natural composition. And so in 2015, she took her case to something called the Court of Arbitration for Sport. 
The CAS is an international body where disputes in the world of sport, they are, they are heard, they are adjudicated. And uh, the IOC, for example, has agreed to respect the rulings of the CAS. And in this instance, and this was in 2015, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, they ruled in Duty Chan's favor. They ruled for her. In 2015, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, they said, all right, natural testosterone may play some role in athleticism, but just what that role is, just how influential testosterone is, we don't know. We, 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 we don't have enough evidence. As a result, the court said you cannot exclude people for hyperandrogenism. That's not justified by current scientific research. Duty Chand was allowed to compete in the 2016 Rio Olympic Games to compete as female. Duty Chand went to Rio. She failed to advance out of the preliminary heats in the 100 meter. Her, her hyperandrogenism did not make her faster than everyone else. But another athlete with hyperandrogenism did very well at the 2016 Games, Castor Semenya of, of South Africa. So let's turn to her now. In the lead up to the 2016 Olympic Games, Castor Semenya endured the same accusations that Duty Chant had. Semenya's fellow competitors, her competitors, they accused her of being, and I'm quoting here, half man. That was one of the accusations. When they made this accusation, they pointed to her height. She's 5'10". They pointed to her weight, 160 pounds. They pointed to her musculature. They also pointed to the fact that Castor Semenya did not shave her armpits. She wore long shorts rather than the bikini style that most women wore in competition. Some of these are biological accusations. Some of these are cultural accusations. Like Duty Chand, Semenya was tested, and it was revealed that she has hyperandrogenism. She, too, was above that threshold, above that 10 nanomoles per liter limit. But like Duty Chand, because of that ruling by the Court of Arbitration for Sport in 2015, she was allowed to compete at the Games. And at the Rio Games in 2016, Castor Semenya won a gold medal. She won a gold medal in the women's 800 meters. 800 meters, twice around the track. I want to watch the last lap here. And here's why I do this. You're, one, you're probably tired of hearing me talk, so let's watch some, some, some sports. But more than that, Castor Semenya's body, her chromosomes, her blood, her genitals, they have been the subject of, I mean, the whole world has been talking about these things. I feel she deserves better, so I just want to appreciate her athletic accomplishment before we start talking about these things. So, a remarkable performance in 2016, but Castor Semenya is not going to get the opportunity to defend her Olympic title in the 800 meters at the next Olympic Games, the Tokyo Games, if they happen this summer. And that is because in 2019, the IOC and the International Track and Field Association, they went back to the Court of Arbitration for, for sport. This time they said we have more data, and this is data that not everyone agrees is accurate or relevant, but they presented their, their case. The IOC and the International Track and Field Federation, they said we have done more research, we believe that five nanomoles per liter is the threshold for being considered female. So that's a, even a, a more restrictive limit. And they say that any athlete with more testosterone than that five nanomoles per liter, they should not be allowed to compete as female in events like the 800 meters. And this time, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, they agreed with them. They agreed with this idea. They ruled against Castor Semenya. Castor Semenya has been told if she wants to compete in the 800 meters at the Olympics, she has to take drugs to lower her natural testosterone level. This is something she says she is not willing to do. And so that's it for Castor Semenya in the 800 meters. If she isn't going to lower her natural testosterone level, she cannot compete as female in the 800 meters at the Olympic Games. 
she can compete as male. I mean, she would allowed, she'd be allowed to compete as male, but she says she is not male. She says she is female. In fact, in her exact words, oh, I thought I had it here. She says, I am Mogadi Castor Semenya. I am a woman and I am fast. All the while, her sex and gender identity, her testosterone levels and speculation about her genitals, it has all been publicly and globally discussed. And like female athletes who have gone through this before, Castor Semenya has likened the entire process to an assault. And so stepping back, not into the background here, but stepping back metaphorically here, here are the big issues. And here's why this is such a, a vexing and controversial issue, I think. First of all, just what role testosterone plays in improving athletic performance. People are arguing about this. The experts, they do not agree. Synthetic testosterone, that is doping with anabolic steroids, that does ramp up performance. But scientists debate exactly what naturally produced testosterone does. Um, one expert who testified at the Court of Arbitration for Sport said, look, it certainly isn't the equivalent of, of, of rocket fuel. So this is debated. Um, but some of the experts say we're making way too much out of testosterone levels to begin with. But let's just say that testosterone does make you faster. Let's say it does. All right. But researchers say there are a lot of things that make you faster. Researchers who study athletes, they have identified more than 200 traits, 200 biological traits that offer athletes competitive advantages. Among them are aerobic abilities, um, the amount of oxygen in your blood, exceptionally long limbs, um, flexible joints, large hands and feet, vision, I mean, all of these things come to play in sports. There are over 200 different variables out there that are specific to individual bodies. The amount of testosterone, that's just one of those variables. So why are we fixated on testosterone? And there are all sorts of ways athletes have biological advantages in sports. For example, Michael Phelps, he's been tested. He has crazy aerobic abilities. He has wild lung power, to use a technical term. Phelps has an uncommonly long torso. Michael Phelps has double jointed ankles that allow his feet to basically act like flippers. I mean, Michael Phelps is biologically built to swim fast. Usain Bolt, he has uncommonly long legs that allow him to take, on average, three fewer steps than every one of his competitors in the 100 meters. He takes three fewer steps. He just gets there faster. Or how about this? Finland's Aero Mantrianta, one of the all-time cross-country greats. He was uh, seven Olympic medals in the 60s and the 1970s. Cross-country skiing is a sport that requires incredible stamina. To have stamina, you need an abundance of red blood cells, right? Red blood cells carry oxygen to your muscles. Mantrianta had a condition, and I'm going to try to pronounce it here, primary familial and congenital. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the last name. That's the condition that he has. This is a condition that causes his body to produce 65% more red blood cells, 65% more red blood cells than the average male. He has a mutation, and it is a gold medal mutation. Here's a photo of Montrianta from about a decade ago. And reporters who talked to him, they were always struck by how red his face and hands were. But he was not red from a sunburn. He was red because he had so many red blood cells. And this was a condition that allowed him to use oxygen way more efficiently, and it gave him a huge athletic advantage. But in all three of these cases, the biological abnormalities of these male athletes, they're either ignored, in fact, that's what they usually are, they're usually just ignored, or they are celebrated as a mark of their physical greatness, their, their athletic remarkableness.
And so here's where I think we can say that's a gender double standard. I mean, these three men can be biologically abnormal. They can be biological outliers, but the IOC says that athletes like Castor Semenya cannot. Let me get two of them up there together. Let me put this crudely, and I'm going to put this very, very crudely. As a man, Michael Phelps can be a biological freak. As a woman, Castor Semenya cannot. And one more thing about testosterone. Male Olympians, many of them have way above average levels of testosterone for men. Um, but no one says that they have an unfair advantage. Men can have as much naturally produced testosterone as they want. There's no upper limit threshold for male testosterone levels. In fact, listen to this. If a male athlete can demonstrate that he has a testosterone deficiency, the IOC will give him a therapeutic exemption and allow him to receive synthetic testosterone. He can dope with their consent. But Duti Chand and Castor Semenya, who are not doping, they have been told that they produce too much natural testosterone, and therefore they will not be considered a woman for the purposes of the Olympic Games. You know, I, I personally am angry for Castor Semenya. I mean, let me put my cards on the table here. I am outraged for her. But, you know, I'm interested in sports too, and I am aware that this is a sticky situation because if you are going to divide sports into male and female categories, which we do, there has to be a line. There has to be a line of division. If you divide sports into any two categories, amateur and professional, black and white, which we used to do, male and female, there has to be a line in between them. But in this instance, what is it? I mean, where is the line? So it seems to me that sports organizations like the IOC, they have a few options. And, and here are the most obvious. Option number one, they can announce, they can announce that there will be no sex verification at all. Anyone who identifies as female can compete as female. And critics say, no way. Right? With that rule, a man could just step up to the starting line, say he identifies as female, and that's exactly true. That could happen. Would it happen? I, I, I have no idea. But it could, uh, but it would also get rid of those humiliating and troubling gender tests. So that's option number one. No sex verification at all. Option number two, the IOC can just get rid of sexual categories in sports. No male and female events, just events. As I briefly mentioned a minute ago, a, a moment ago, they already do that in the equestrian competition. And I would imagine that eliminating the male-female divide in sports like um, archery, it, it probably wouldn't be a, be a problem. In fact, I think it was just two years ago, the European dart champion, I know that's not exactly archery, but it's close, was a female athlete. But if you got rid of the divide in events like this, like the 100 meters, um, eliminate male and female competitions and just say the 10 fastest human beings, well, I don't think this is a particularly controversial statement, but women will no longer be in the finals of the 100 meters. Um, they just won't. So I think this is a counterproductive option, option number two. Option number three, the IOC can continue to try to find the line that differentiates male from female. Maybe it's a doctor's determination. Maybe it's the size and shape of genitalia. Maybe it's the amount of testosterone. Maybe it's breast size. And I say that to be provocative because one of the accusations against Castor Semenya was that she was quote unquote flat chested and that demonstrated that she was not a real woman. Maybe it's height. I don't know. Men are, in general, taller than women, so maybe we should just say 5 foot 10. Everyone 5 foot 10 and higher, you compete as a man. Everyone under 5 foot 10, you compete as a, as a woman. That is totally absurd, of course, but maybe that androgen threshold is equally absurd. 
The IOC can search for the line that divides male from female, but it seems pretty clear to me that no neat and easy dividing line exists. Nature is just too messy and complex. There are other ideas out there that people are, are proposing, and, and maybe we could talk about it in, in the question and, and, and answers. Um, but finally, I'm going to mention this because of all of the recent discussion about transgender athletes. What about transgender Olympians, world-class athletes who have transitioned from one sex to another? Well, the IOC, um, they have rules about this as well. They, they have recently worked out the following rules. Female to male transitioning athletes, FTMs, they can compete in the male category with no restriction. Right? If you declare yourself to be male, you are considered male. There is no test for maleness at the Olympic Games. Male to female athletes, right, MTFs, they have to demonstrate that their testosterone level has been below 10 nanomoles, 10 nanomoles per liter for at least a year, at least a year before competition. And in the track and field events, in most of the track and field events, they have to demonstrate that it's been below 5 nanomoles per, per liter. Um, if they are under that threshold for a full year, the athlete is considered female regardless of any previous gender identity. And so this is going to be one of the big stories at the Tokyo Games this summer, again, if they happen, where at least three transgender athletes, MTF athletes, male to female, are expected to compete. Among them is Chelsea Wolf, that's her there, an American athlete who competes in freestyle BMX. Wolf transitioned from male to female. Another one is Tiffany Abreu, a Brazilian volleyball player who a few, who a few years ago transitioned from male to female. She is expected to be on the Brazilian volleyball team at the games this summer. When the games happen in 2021, if they happen this summer, Abreu is going to be one of the big stories at those Olympic Games. So stay tuned. And Max, I right. think I've said what I got to say. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, what a fantastic and fascinating and fr frankly just angering uh, subject in many ways. Uh, really, really eye-opening. Thank you for that. We'll uh, take a look at some of the questions we have coming in. I want to remind everyone to use our uh, question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and we'll start with the question from Katie Williams. Uh, some you've addressed this somewhat, um, I guess, maybe a little bit more on the threshold for men yeah. to no longer be considered men. I uh, mean, like like beyond men, whatever yeah. that, whatever <laughs> that th that is. Yeah, no, there there is no threshold. That's the you know, men can have as much testosterone as they want. Many male Olympians, again, they have way greater than average amounts of testosterone in their body. Um, there is no threshold for men whatsoever. Again, some men have lots of uh, the weightlift, weightlifters. And lots. in the other direction, there's no threshold either. If you're a man competing oh. as a man and you've got very, very low testosterone, no one cares. No one cares. Uh, right. Um, and, and, and you can't announce that you're female, though, at the same same time. Um, that's, that's one of the rules as well. Um, but again, uh, men can get testosterone put into them. Um, synthetic testosterone if they want. Well, um, where we again, we want to get some questions from our audience, so don't be shy, folks. Please go ahead and use the question and answer button there at the bottom and uh, go ahead and feel free to submit some questions. I have a question for you. It might be a little off color, but the title of your talk was Sex at the Olympic Games, so I'm going to just ask you about actual sexual intercourse at the, <laughs> at the Olympic Games. And just I'm, I, I only say this because I've heard stories about, you know, the, the, the Olympic Village being a wild place. Is, do you have any sense of what it's like uh, have there been uh, have there been romantic relationships that have developed between people from different countries at the olympics and you know just thinking about romance and max there is no way that all these young fit beautiful people all put together you know 10,000 of them in a small space are having sex i just refuse to believe it i okay it must happen all the time i've heard stories people say it happens all the time. Um, I think that's one of the pleasures of being 
an Olympic athlete, I guess. There is one famous story that actually um, goes back to uh, something we were talking about last time. Uh, at the, the, the Cold War Olympic Games, there was a, a when I think of this, there was a, a Cold War romance that, that sprouted between an American hammer thrower, he was in the hammer throw, named Hal Connolly, and a Czech discus thrower named Olga Fikatova. And I guess he was throwing the hammer and she was throwing the discus and they eyed each other across the field and, you know, sparks flew, of course. How could they, they not? And they started talking and it was all kind of a big deal because, well, this is the Cold War and Americans and Czechs, maybe we need to keep them separate. But this, this, this romance blossomed. Uh, they fell in love. They got engaged. They were married in Prague, actually. And this was in... Um, uh, was, well, it was between 1956 and 1960, um, and then they moved to the United States. And it was a kind of a big propaganda coup in the United States to get this Czech athlete to become an American, so to speak. And Olga Fikatova, who became Olga Connolly, she actually got American citizenship. She was allowed to compete as an American in, in subsequent games. In fact, she represented the United States in 1960, 1964, 1968. And in 1972, she was actually given the honor of carrying the American flag into the Olympic Stadium. So yeah, love blooming uh, in, in this sort of unlikely Cold War scenario. That's exactly the kind of story we're hoping for, where you know love can solve the Cold War. Yeah, right? they got divorced though. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, as we wait for some questions, I guess I want to just ask you. To, uh, we know right now there's been a lot of controversy about younger athletes, high school athletes, and younger, and the notion of transgender, and it's been controversial. Of course, in many states are enacting laws. Yeah. Um, can you speak to to the difference between Olympic athletes? and younger athletes in this, or is there any, or, or all the conditions the same? Well, this is what the scientists are debating right now. Um, look, w w as a society, this has become one of the issues all of a sudden. And let me just begin by saying this, and here, here's how I interpret this. Like with the bathroom bill in this state, HB2, uh, to my knowledge, there was no problem, no epidemic of people going into the quote unquote wrong bathroom. And to my knowledge, there are very few instances in which um, uh, transgender teenagers are, are, are causing issues in, in sports. This has clearly become a politicized issue. It's something for people to, you know, make, make political hay out of and and so the, the the amount of hysteria that's out there about this is just not commensurate with any type of perceived problem or or issue and look uh, i'm learning about this stuff right now as well i'm learning about what happens when when um Boys, I mean, just because I'm talking about people 18 or under 18, when boys begin doing hormone therapy and transition to female, and some say that that's um, you know sort of biologically fair to have them compete as female. Some say no, it takes it takes longer for them to be biologically female. I, I'm very much trying to figure this stuff out and learn this with everyone else. But again the degree to which we are talking about this and the degree to which, if I may, when people propose these pieces of legislation, they usually say that they're doing it to protect female athletes. They're doing it to protect women. Um, I don't buy it. I, 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 it really seems to me that they're doing this for political reasons and they're doing this to make it as uncomfortable as possible for transgender people really just to be out in public, like that bathroom bill. I mean, clearly that was one of the effects of it. Great, thank you for that. And again, I want to invite people to give us some questions. Um, Matt, you and I had a great discussion about Billie Jean King in mm -hmm. the 1970s, and we talked about the intersection of you know, the women's liberation movement with <laughs> athletics in the 1970s and Billie Jean King's you know, trailblazing uh, efforts uh, in on that front. Can you speak to uh, any crossover into the Olympics in terms of uh, uh, women speaking out, women organizing in terms of the Olympics? Um, 
and, and any way that uh, we can see a crossover between, say, sort of the United States Title IX issues and what was happening on the international level? Yeah, well, when I t talk about the, um, the Olympic Games, the recent uh, American success in the Olympic Games, um, one of the things that I always emphasize is exactly that, Title IX. Um, beginning in 1984, uh, American women start doing very, very well at the Olympic Games. 1984, the Soviets weren't there, Eastern Europeans weren't there. But, but, but look at medal counts now uh, at the Olympic Games, particularly you know, in, in sports like, like track and field, and the American women are at the top of the heap. And that's because of Title IX. You know, 1984, the Los Angeles Games, these are the games where Americans just won absolutely everything. And there are a number of reasons for this, but one reason is that you had a whole Title IX generation. They were now young women, right? They had been, um, in, in, beginning in the mid-1970s, they begin being allowed to play sports. Their schools are actually um, funding them and allowing them to play sports. And American women, they run, you know, with that opportunity. And so the American success, if, if people are still interested in medal counts, uh, think about the American success, female success at the Olympic Games. Think about uh, in the Olympics, actually, when does women's soccer start to become a phenomenon in the United States? It's really the 1996 Atlanta Olympics when the United States, led by UNC's Mia Hamm, they won gold in 1996. This is when people really started getting excited about women's soccer. And of course, it carries over to the Women's World Cup in 1999 in that incredible match against China in the final. Um, that does not happen. Those events do not happen. Those moments do not occur without Title IX legislation in the early 1970s. Was there any corollary in other nations or was the IOC, uh, was the IOC in favor of Title IX and was the IOC mm. thinking about promoting such things in other countries? It's a great question, Max. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I could do what I usually do and just try to, you know, bluff something. <laughs> but no, we, we appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I know. I honestly don't, don't know what, 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 what the answer is. Uh, again, um, that issue in many of the socialist countries, uh, that issue wasn't there. You know, in, 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 in the socialist countries, it, theoretically and to a large extent uh, uh, in, 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 in sort of real time, female athletes were given these opportunities. Again, that's why the Soviets did so well in the 1950s and the Eastern Europeans. That's why China, that the, the, the Chinese state-supported sports system, one of the things we're going to talk about next time, um, they, they fund and they support their female athletes and Chinese women in gymnastics and in archery and in diving, you know, they do very, very well because they're getting support from their country. Great, thank you for that. We have a question here from our friend and the director of Carolina Public Humanities, Lloyd Kramer. Hello out there, Lloyd. Uh, when did the history of sports and the Olympics become important to historians? Uh, can you come to understand historical changes more clearly through sports than through other sp aspects of political or economic history? I don't know if you can understand it more clearly um, than through economic history or political history, but the argument for it, if you wanted to make that argument, Lloyd, is that people care about sports. <laughs> you know, people don't watch. W Think of an organization that's parallel to the Olympics, uh, the IOC. It's the United Nations, right? And very, very important things happen at the United Nations. In fact, think about like when we were talking about nationalism last time. Um, where do nations want to be represented? You know, how do you tell the world that you are a legitimate political entity? It's in one of two places. It's with a seat at the United Nations, and it's by marching in the parade of nations at the Olympic Games. But I don't know anyone who watches what goes on at the, the United Nations. Uh, we don't sell beer ads and sell hamburgers. Uh, Americans, they don't watch that, but we watch sports. And so the argument, look, we can make the argument that sports are way overvalued, that they're way too popular in American society, but you cannot make the argument that Americans don't care about sports. And so that's why I think, you know, in, in my classes and why historians more and more, you know, for a while, long time historians were uninterested in talking about sports. You know, uh, sports, that's what dumb jocks do and we're people of the mind and so we don't want to talk about these, these issues. But, you know, like so many areas of social and cultural history, whether it's music 
or movies and sports. You know, it's really in the, in the, in the 70s and the 80s that people, historians, started to pay attention to these types of things. Boy, more and more um, institutions, uh, colleges, and, and, and universities are, are, are starting to realize that this is a great way to talk about the issues that, that, that matter. And just I'll, I'll say this as, a, as a, like a plug for my own courses. What better way to get young people to come into a classroom and talk about issues about race and gender and national identity, issues that maybe they're not terribly interested in talking about or comfortable talking about, but they'll talk about it if we're talking about Jackie Robinson and Billie Jean King and the American participation in the Olympic Games. Great. Thank you for that, Matt. Much agreed there. Um, we have a comment here, a uh, question uh, from Jane. I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, how are members of the IOC selected? Mm. If they're making the rules about gender treatment, then it seems a change in their membership might cause a change in policy. Well, um, the IOC, you'll be shocked to hear, was an all-male organization all the way until, I can't remember if it's the late 1970s or the early 1980s, but it's, 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 it's right around then. That's, that, that's when the IOC started admitting their, their first female members. The IOC is made up of a bunch of different types of people. Um, there are princes and princesses, there are sheiks, there are former athletes, there are former politicians. Um, you have to be invited. Um, there are no elections. You are invited, so a sort of closed uh, door negotiations, and it, you are invited to be a member of the IOC. I just suppose that my invitation has been lost in the mail. Um, but it is a good gig if you can get it, because you get to go to Monaco every year for an IOC meeting, and you get to go to the Olympics. Uh, it used to be an even, be a, an even better gig before the IOC actually started looking at corruption when they found all the things that IOC members they were being given by 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 cities it's actually Salt Lake City the Winter Games in 2002 um, the Salt Lake City Olympic Committee was giving away medical treatment and uh, spots at BYU University and liposuction for the wives of IOC members that kind of blew the whole lid off of this this corruption uh, Sydney also into 2000 yeah so it is a a, a, a closed membership um, once again, they 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 they, they operate. Uh, you know, they have a, 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 a beautiful um, headquarters in Lausanne, Switzerland. It is a great great gig if you can get it. Uh, it's about um, thirty percent female right now to go, uh, and, and I know that because someone asked me this this question last time I was teaching this course, and I didn't know the answer. And I guessed. I thought, oh, it's probably. 8% female. It just seemed to go, go in line with, with, with the way international sports organization. But I was totally wrong. It's about one-third female. And out of how many members? Uh, oh, boy. It's uh, over 100 now at, at this point. Yeah, don't, don't exactly quote me on that. I, I can't, can't remember. But you're right. Maybe that's what has to change, right? Oh, um, although it's a lot of institutions would have to change. The International Track and Field Association, the Court of Arbitration for, for Sport, all of these powerful organizations have kind of weighed in on this issue. Paul's always on it. 110 members. 110. All right. Thank you. I was close. Very close. I was close. Um, I, you know, we have an anonymous attendee, and I think this is probably shared by uh, other folks, and we'll just put it right out there. I'm sorry I competed in high school female sports in the 1970s. I would not want to compete against the transgender female. Biological yeah, yeah. men have physical advantages that women do not have and do not go away due to hormone treatments. Well, so look, that's the argument, right? And again, I, I, that's why I, I, I slowed down and I wanted to emphasize this. The accusation that Castor Semi and Duty Chan, that what they were doing, that it just wasn't fair. It wasn't made by the IOC first. It wasn't made by their, uh, uh, their National Olympic committees. It was made by other female athletes. Uh, I just have to question whether Castor Semenya is not female. Uh, that's just it. That's the, that's the crux of the issue. Um, is she not female because she's tall? Is she not female because she's muscular? Is she not female because she's fast? I mean, that's what people said about Helen Stevens. She's just too fast in 1936 to be an actual woman. Um, I am not saying I know what the line is between male and female. I am definitely not saying that. Um, I am saying this, though, and I actually didn't say this. So let me say this. The fact that we're so fixated on testosterone rather than um, any number of things. 
I think a lot of it just has to do with our cultural ideals about what women are supposed to look like. Uh, women are not supposed to be muscular. Women are not supposed to be big. Women are supposed to be smaller and they're supposed to be lithe. Um, women are, so, what's the most popular event at the Summer Olympics? It's women's gymnastics, where the competitors are small, they're tiny, they're exceedingly feminine, they put ribbons in their hairs, they wear makeup, they conform to certainly Western ideas about gender in a way that Castor Semenya just does not. Um, I don't know how to pronounce authoritatively on Castor Semenya. I, I just find it interesting that she doesn't look like so many, you know, so many societies value womanhood. And for that reason, it's the testosterone that's what people pick on. And, and in the case of, of uh, Castor, this is a, a person whose natural body um, at, has produced this andro uh, these levels of, yeah. of androgen. Uh, and and I, I, you know, I guess I know it's, a, it's a weighty waters, heavy waters to get into, but when someone transitions from male to female, and, and what if their body is exactly like Castor's at the end of that? You know, it just, it seems to me like that's so hard to make a distinction. There. Yeah, I agree. I, and again, that's, look, that is the problem. We have done this to ourselves. We have decided that we're going to divide sports into male and female. And let me just point this out. We used to do, we used to divide sports into black and white all the time. Oh, black people and white people can't compete against each other in sports. They're just not the same. And so we had rules and we had laws and we didn't allow it to happen. We don't think in those terms anymore. Um, but we've divided it into male and female. We've divided our bathrooms into male and female. It's a vexing, complicated issue, and it's, it's something that we have done to ourselves. And, and uh, Katie Williams said, you did address some of what Katie Williams was asking. We were uh, just asking about governors signing these bills and yeah. whatnot. But in particular, one interesting point, it sort of speaks just to what you were saying about um, why is it track and field is this particular sport that everyone uh, it, it picks up on. Well, it, it, and in fact, you don't have to have the, if it's archery, there is no, the, the five nanomoles per, per, per liter barrier is not there for things like, like archery. Um, uh, and, and it's weird, and I cannot get a straight answer on this. You would think that an event like the 100 meters would be an event where just pure power and speed and testosterone would most come into play. But the, the IOC and the Court of Arbitration for Sport has ruled that the testosterone level for 100 meters is 10 nanomoles per, per liter. Um, for events, I think it's 400 meters between 1,500 meters, they have decided it's 5 nanomoles per, per liter. So here's what Castor Semenya is, is, is doing. There is no nanomole per liter threshold for the 5,000 meters. She's trying to turn herself into a 5,000 meter runner and be at the Olympic Games. She just won the South African championship in that event, but she did not have a time low enough to qualify for the Tokyo Games, but she's still trying. Those are very different races. Those are just I mean, completely different races. 800 is almost like a sprint. Yeah, right, the, right, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's just a completely different uh, race. We have time for one more question here. Jason, uh, Jason Beckham asks, uh, do you have any examples of the things the IOC does now to support Olympic athletes that no longer compete? And or do you have any thoughts on how the IOC could do a better job of supporting these retired athletes? Huh. Well, I suppose, uh, the, yeah, they, they could share the money. <laughs> um, and I suppose the way they would share the money is by giving it to the National Olympic Committees. Um, you know, uh, how could the IO, I mean, I suppose there could be some sort of uh, Olympic trust fund, you know, everyone who's competed in the Olympic Games. Well, uh, you know, more and more athletes are getting money. Uh, well, first of all, you can make money through endorsements, but you can also, uh, some countries, they give financial awards. Uh, you win a gold medal, you'll get this much money. Um, in fact, there are a lot of countries. Bahrain is a great example. Bahrain is basically luring over Kenyans and saying become Bahrainian and represent us in the Olympic Games and we'll pay you to win medals. We want the Bahrainian flag flying above the Olympic um, 
stadium. Um, there was a, 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 a great Jamaican runner, Max, you may remember her, Marlene Audie. She was a great sprinter in the 1980s and the 1990s. And then she could no longer run for Jamaica anymore. So she became, oh, I can't remember, I think she was, became Slovenian. Slovenia said, come, we'll give, you, uh, we'll give you money to become Slovenian and then represent us at the Olympic Games. So the National Olympic Committees are starting to pay out the winners. I suppose it would be the National Olympic Committees that would be best sort of suited to, 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 to dole out some sort of financial remuneration for people who have represented themselves with distinction at the Olympic Games. Great, thank you for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Andrews, thank you. Uh, fantastic. Um, we'll take a little break here and we'll come back for our fourth and final lecture. Go get yourselves a refreshment and we'll see you in about 20 minutes. Thank you.